one of the things that men should do as they mature is transform themselves into monsters, but also become civilized at the same time. And that, that's exactly what you see in stories like Beauty and the Beast, where the, 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 the ideal man starts out as a beast and ends up civilized. He doesn't start out as a milksop, wimp sort of character who, you know, who, who poses no threat to anyone and then becomes the hero. That isn't how it works, although there are stories of that kind of development. The reason that Harry Potter can withstand Voldemort is because he's got a piece of him. Right, he's been touched by it, and the way, that you, the way that you keep the psychopaths at bay is to develop the inner psychopath so that you know one when you see one. Right? And then, but that's a voluntary thing, it's, 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 so it's like, a, it's like a, a set of tools that you have at your disposal, which is full knowledge of evil. The question is, well, should you turn into a monster? And the answer to that is, yes, you should. But you should do it voluntarily and not accidentally, and you should do it with the good in mind rather than falling prey to it by possession, essentially, because that's the alternative. Now, how does it possess you? That's easy. Your suffering makes you bitter. Your bitterness makes you resentful. Your resentment means, makes you vengeful. And once you're on that road, you go down that a little bit farther, man. You watch all those rom-coms where there's always kind of a beta male guy who's being real friendly and always failing miserably with the women because basically he's lying to himself and to them. Um, He's a persona, and a persona is the face that you show to the world when you're trying to uh, pretend and to convince yourself and others that you're, I would say harmless, but we could say a good person. But a good person isn't harmless. A good person is capable of, well, maybe a good person is capable of anything, but is willing to hold that in abeyance. Well, if you're harmless, you're not virtuous. You're just harmless. You're like a rabbit. A rabbit isn't virtuous. It's just, it just can't do anything except get eaten. It's not virtuous. If you're a monster and you don't act monstrously, then you're virtuous. The hero has to be a monster. But a controlled monster. Batman is like that, you know? I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's the story you always hear. For example, Lots of my clients, my clinical clients, are too agreeable. And um, they're generally women, because women are more agreeable than men. But not always, because I've had agreeable men as clients as well. And what happens is, they, they're resentful, and, and they don't know how to stand up for themselves. And it's because they're very compassionate by nature. And so, if you're entering into a negotiation with them, they'll let you win. Well, that's not so good, because you know, you need to win too. Especially if you're in an organization of adults, where there's there's a struggle, right? With, when you have kids, you can let them win, especially infants. You're like, you have to let them win, and that's partly why compassion is so necessary. But as a, as a basis for negotiation between adults, it's like, sorry, it's, it's insufficient. You have, to, you have to be a bit of a monster so that you can say no. And so a lot of what you do in, in psychotherapy is treat people's anxiety and depression. That's a huge chunk of it. Help them straighten out the way they think, that's a huge chunk of it, but another chunk of it is well let's toughen you up, you know, let's put you in a position where you can bargain, let's teach you how to assert yourself and stand up for yourself, and that's assertiveness training, and it's a huge chunk of psychotherapy and you need to, you need to learn it, it's like, because part of how you regulate your interactions with other people is to negotiate and you cannot negotiate unless you can say no, you can't do it and it causes conflict to say no, and if you don't like conflict, which is basically the definition of being agreeable, then you can't tolerate the conflict, and so then you can't negotiate on your own behalf, and so then you keep losing, and you're bullied, and you know, it's, it's not good. Then you get resentful, and, and it's really not good. So you have to develop your inner monster a little bit, and, and then that makes you a better person, not a worse person. It's weird. It's weird. But but that's just how it is. I don't believe that women do have a tendency to prefer d bad men higher in dark triad traits. They may have a tendency to be more erotically uh, attracted to men who are capable of manifesting um, dominance and aggression. I think the, the, the evidence for that is relatively clear, and I don't think the Bible at all des describes a mode of being as associated with nice guy traits. Um, I, I, I don't know that, that may be how it's classically taught, for example, because 
Christ is often presented, especially in more simple-minded vari variants, and I I'm not being um, um, pejorative about that precisely, as the ultimate in nice guys, but I don't think that that's true at all. That's a reasonable characterization at all if you read the gospel accounts, because he was someone who was certainly capable of saying very, very harsh things to people and was also identified very strongly as a figure who was capable of using judgment and distinguishing between what was positive and what was negative. And that capacity for judgment is um, something quite different than, than, than the mere nice guy compassion that would be associated with high levels of trait agreeableness. So I think that um, the, the idea that the ideal that's put forward in the biblical writings is something like be harmless. I think that's a real misreading of the text. And uh, I also think that it's, it's, it's wrong because harmless and good are not the same thing at all. And in fact, I think one of the best ways of characterizing like a higher order morality, and this is something that Nietzsche talked about a fair bit, is that, and, and Jung as well, with regards to the idea of integration of the shadow, is that someone whose moral has the capability for violence and the capability for aggression built in and at hand, but is also someone who's perfectly capable of controlling that in a civilized manner. And I think that, um, you know, I'm speaking off the cuff here, obviously, but I think that the, the, the attraction that some women have for the, for the sort of men who are more likely to misbehave, uh, to, to act in a delinquent manner and so forth, is partly their desire to be associated with men who have the capacity for aggression. Without the capability for mayhem, you're a, you're, you're a, you're a potential victim to mayhem. So you need your sword, it should be sheathed, but you need to have it. And it's very frequently the case if you treat someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, the, there's two things you have to do. You have to help them develop a very articulated philosophy of evil. Because otherwise their brain bothers them over and over and over. Why were you so naive? How did you become victimized? Why were you such a sucker? These are good questions. You don't want to have that happen to you again. You don't want to be exploited twice. Okay, so your eyes have to open up. We know the price of that from the Egyptian myth, right? You come into contact with Seth. What happens? Even if you're a god, you lose an eye. It's no joke, man. It's no joke. And then the cure for that is the movement down into the underworld and re the revitalization of the father. That's the identification with the force that created culture, right? And that then there's you and that together. Then you can withstand malevolence. Maybe you can withstand tragedy and malevolence. And second, they have to learn to become dangerous. Because that's the only way out. What's the alternative? They get these recurrent thoughts about their vulnerability in the face of malevolence and their own naivety because by definition, if someone psychopathic has exploited you, you're too naive. It's, it's a definitional issue. You can say, well, that's no fault of mine. How the hell could I be prepared? Fair enough, man. A perfectly reasonable objection doesn't solve your problem because it's an, it's an eternal problem. The meek shall inherit the earth, but I was looking up the multiple translations of the word meek and Meek is actually derived from a Greek word, of course, um, meant something like uh, those who have weapons and the ability to use them but, ser but determined to keep them sheathed will inherit the world. And that means that people who are capable of force, let's say, but decide not to use it are in the proper moral position. And Nietzsche commented on that a fair bit too, you know, he, he um, thought of most moral, morality as cowardice, not because morality itself was cowardice, but because most people who are cowards disguise their coward, cowardice as morality. And they claim that their harmlessness, which is actually a consequence of their fear and inability to be harmful, say, or to be dangerous, is actually a sign of their moral integrity. And that's a really bad idea. There's two pathways to the development of the shadow, and they're tightly allied with one another. Um, the fundamental pathway is truth, and that's to face the bitter truth about yourself. But to break that down more particularly, you might think about that as the capacity to observe your own resentment. You're going to be resentful and bitter in many situations because you don't get what you want. And if you watch that resentment and bitterness, you'll see that it produces fantasies that can be unbelievably dark. 
And that can be very frightening and you might not want to admit to yourself that you're actually capable of having fantasies like that or impulses of like that or aggressive feelings like that. But the thing is, is that if those aggressive feelings and impulses and fantasies are integrated into your character, it's like you're opening up a dialogue with a part of yourself that can be very forceful and strong and dangerous. And it's really useful to be dangerous because if you can if you can be dangerous, you often don't have to be. Men who've integrated their shadow often also develop a kind of peculiar grace that would be a consequence of not only allowing their aggressive side to step forward, but also their, their feminine and compassionate side that, might, that they may have kept squelched because of embarrassment about it or because they'd been harassed for being weak or any number of things. So, but the practical approach for developing your shadow, I would say, is to co contemplate and consider your resentment and notice what it says and because your resentment will also tell you what you have to say if you're feeling oppressed at work or you're oppressed in your life or or you know or you're oppressing yourself then you got to notice that you're feeling oppressed then you have to notice that you're feeling resentful resentful and and, and angry and bitter and maybe even like Cain in the story of Cain and Abel because Cain is sort of the archetypal bitter man and then you have to decide what it is that you need to do in order to remove from yourself that bitterness. And that usually means that there's something that you have to say. And then you have to say it because your soul depends on it. And not only does your soul depend on it, I would say the fate of the world depends on it. Because, you know, you might be wrong and then you should be straightened out. Maybe you're just being whiny and you have to talk to somebody about that. But it may be that you're actually detecting something wrong, some tyranny that's directed towards you and other people. And it's like your moral obligation to speak up about it. And so many workplaces become toxic, to use a terrible cliche, because the people in them won't speak up for what they actually want, or they speak up too late, and then they're all twisted up about it, and, and you know, they're torturing other people because they're so unhappy, and so forth, and so on. So, practical approach for developing your shadow, fundamentally, is radical honesty. And Jung said that, you know, a genuine moral effort was a good substitute for psychotherapy. You should work to become the friend of the thing that disrupts your plan because there's a lot of that. And then if you become the friend of the thing that disrupts your plan, then you, be, you start to develop strength in proportion to the, to the disruptive force. And that's really what you want. You want to be able to implement your plan, obviously, but you want to be able to take on the consequences of error and learn from it. And then, then you win constantly because even if something goes sideways, you think, there's something to be derived from this. That's wisdom, fundamentally. So, and so those are the eternal domains, right? There's the domain of order. That's a snake, by the way. And that's a domain of chaos. And that's the world. And maybe you're in the order and maybe you're in the chaos, but those can flip on you. And maybe you shouldn't be in either of those places. Maybe you should be right in the middle. And that's where you should be, as far as I can tell. And I think this is, this is another escape from postmodern nihilism, let's say. That's actually a real place.